Hey, sports fans, it's Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. This is Socialing the Distance. We are featuring Max Siegel, CEO of USA Track and Field this morning. Max, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Larry, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be on the show. Really appreciate it. Cool. And I do love the Packers helmet in the background. Got to say, it's a good way to start my day. So thank you. You know, we're, we're in a little morning in Wisconsin right now, but, you know, we can we can deal with it. Hey, it's a great franchise with great players and great people on that team. That's cool. Um, I wanted to, first of all, thank you so much, uh, USA Track and Field, for what you guys have done to support Paul Doyle's American Track League. Can you tell us a little bit of the story about how you guys decided to get involved and in, in what what you're doing? Yeah, we, we've been uh, collaborating in uh, different ways with Paul over the years. I think that COVID has really forced all of us to get creative, uh, to figure out how to create support, competitive opportunities here domestically for our athletes. Uh, you know, and Paul had the American Track League concept a couple of years ago. I think that uh, there are a group of people uh, within our organization that have all been looking for ways that the athletes can compete. And, you know, Paul had the indoor meets, uh, went out the first week, and uh, we really wanted to come alongside of him to not only create a great experience for the athletes to get out there competitively, uh, but to present it in a way uh, that made sense. And I think that, you know, uh, really getting creative with production cost and presentation and uh, promoting it and uh, also, you know, giving some assistance with travel grants uh, are all things and housing that we could do in a very small way to start to elevate um, that product. But Paul's a really important part of our community, uh, has had a lot of vision, cares about the athletes, and uh, we're looking for ways to grow that relationship. Cool. Yeah, I thought the second meet was fantastic. I mean, Paul Swangard, Otto Bolden, and Lewis are three of our faves. And to allow them to do what they need to do to present the meet. And we've got these great performers who are just going crazy because they haven't had a lot of places to compete. Yeah, you know, I, I, I usually don't do this because I think that it is um, our job to be behind the scenes and to promote our athletes. But I have to give Adam Schmank and Entertainment Properties team Please. a lot of credit. Yeah. Really rolling up his sleeves on short notice, reaching out to Swan Guard and Otto and those kind of guys and, and working with Paul on scheduling and the production of that event. I think it'll continue to get better. Good. Um, I do want to give credit where credit's due. And I want to thank Adam for his efforts with that as well. Yeah, I thought we could see a little bit of Adam in there. I, no, I've teased him a couple times and tried to get him on video and he will not do it. And, uh, but the, you can see the work and his attention to detail. And I, that means a lot to the sport. Um, I said something a couple weeks ago, and I just wanted to run it by you. Uh, a couple of your predecessors had told me in the past that, Hey, look, we don't need more track meets. We need better track meets. Um, you being in the entertainment industry and, um, understanding the sports is entertainment. Give me three things that are important in um, a good track meet to be when it's being shown on television. Yeah, I, I think that I would agree with some of that statement. I do. Okay. Think that, I think that we do need uh, opportunities. Again, you, you look at it from the competition standpoint. So we need as many opportunities for our athletes to stay fitness ready and to compete as we possibly can. But in terms of building equity in a property, I would agree that the more efficient and predictable it is, uh, is really important. I, I think that, you know, in the landscape of entertainment and sports being as cluttered, we need to present it in a way that is efficient, that captures everyone's attention. Uh, I think we gotta really, really, really do a lot on the storytelling of our athletes. You know, I want to hold, uh, I'm going to host a seminar with our athletes. I think that one of the things as I watch uh, these tremendous athletic performances uh, in the interview process, I think we have plenty of opportunities for the athletes to include thanking their sponsors and bringing recognition to things in the sport, just even in that interview process. But, you know, everything from the presentation, the branding, the storytelling, and even most importantly, uh, having them scheduled at a time where people know where to go to see them. Uh, yeah. That's that is when you get on linear TV. But the reality of the situation is 
compelling content works. I mean, people are consuming media different. They're going to streaming. So I really, really think that, you know, getting in and really showcasing the personality behind the athletes will do a lot to, 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 to create an emotional connection from our fans to our sport in general. Do you believe we need um, more meets during the summer season in the United States in a non pandemic year? Or do you think the European season does its does it well? Well, I, I think, you know, when you look at it globally, you want to make sure that you have uh, the most interesting competition and you want to have it in front of the biggest audience and in the best TV window. I think that from, you know, just a logistic standpoint, it would be really great for us to have more meets domestically mm -hmm. where the athletes in the region didn't necessarily have to travel as far. And then we presented more opportunities for them to earn uh, prize money and also more opportunities for fan engagement. So I'm a big fan at looking at our region. And, you know, even when we do something regionally, it'll be open to, uh, you know, the global community. So so um, we do want to provide more domestic competitive opportunities uh, for our athletes. Uh, the New Balance Indoor Grand Prix, uh, which is a meet put on by Mark Wetmore and Global Athletics, has been an iconic meet in the U.S. And there were some challenges this year. Uh, we're doing the story after talking to Mark about how get to Staten Island. Was USA Track and Field involved in that meet? Or are they involved in that meet? Yeah, we, we, we work closely with Mark as well. Um, mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that we're pretty proud of, you know, not just even from a sanctioning perspective, but, you know, different meet directors and local organizing committees who host these things, uh, we look at ways that USA Track and Field can add value. Um, and so, yes, we work closely with Mark, you know, on the television production and some of the things that he might need to enhance that meet as well. Um, you have one of the things that I think is that I've really admired what you were able to do is the long term contract with Nike. Um, obviously, Nike and Adidas are the two biggest supporters of global athletics. There are times when you have to work with other brands, like, for example, this upcoming world championships in Eugene. Is it difficult to juggle relationships with multiple brands? No, absolutely not. I think that that is a myth that's out there. Obviously, each brand is looking to maximize their exposure in a particular category. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at other sports, it's been done uh, pretty seamlessly. You know, you may have Adidas as the team uniform back in the day in the NBA, but you had LeBron James or Michael Jordan as Nike athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, NASCAR has Chevrolet. They have Ford and Toyota cars on the field of play in the track. You know, so I, I think that it is really about uh, coordination. Our athletes represent all of the shoe companies and the brands. And I have generally found that the executives at each one of the companies, while they're highly competitive and really trying to get maximum exposure, uh, they're vested in the overall well-being of our sport. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that people I don't think they realize is, you know, we give direct funding to our athletes. Sure. 60 to 70 percent of our athletes that get funding from USA Track and Field are non-Nike athletes. See, so, people don't uh, know that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah no clue. And, 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 you know, and it, and it is and it is something that uh, we're proud of. And, 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 you know, our partnership with all of our commercial partners, including Nike, uh, allows us to invest in programs across the organization and in high performance. So, uh, you know, you'll see every brand represented in our hospitality suite at Olympic trials. Uh, mm -hmm. There are opportunities for brands to buy ads in our broadcast. Uh, we highlight stories of athletes um, that are from the different companies. So, you know, we, we are really careful to make sure that we are um, uh, supporting all of our partners, uh, but we also want to celebrate all the athletes from the different brands. Cool. Recently, we've had some, um, it's not the greatest press about whereabouts testing. What do you guys tell athletes that are emerging or getting up to the level where they're going to be involved in whereabouts testing. Does USATF talk to them about this beforehand? Well, you know, we, we have uh, both our rookie seminar, we have our agent seminar, we have opportunities to work with the AAC uh, and the agents, uh, generally speaking. As you know, all of the drug testing with USADA and whereabouts is done independent of the Federation. 
but we do talk to people about um, our athletes about accountability, um, sure. professionalism, and really um, drilling home the point that there is a, there are a lot of expectations uh, and a high level of accountability as you you know ascend into the professional ranks. You've been juggling a crazy year, and it started, gosh, last uh, February um, with the pandemic. And you've had to have the sad position to cancel championships that haven't been canceled in 130 years. Um, can you give us a share a little light on that process, how you look at a meet and say, hey, look, we want to do this, but we can't do it. Yeah, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Robert Chapman heads up our COVID working group, uh, which is comprised of medical professionals and scientists uh, within our sport and in coordination with other sports. Uh, at the heart of everything that we do in that area, safety is really first. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that we have tons of passionate people in the sport, uh, and we do everything that we can to um, execute our competitions. Uh, but they have to be done in a safe manner. So we also put together a working group uh, that takes a look at the events, the logistics, uh, how to um, really uh, deliver, uh, which in includes, you know, Mike Conley from High Performance and Wallace Spearman from AAC. Uh, Vin Lanana sits on that group as well. Myself, Renee Washington, Duffy Mahoney, uh, and Robert Chapman. Mm -hmm. So internally, we're looking at Adam Schmank, you know, we're looking at logistics. So what will happen, for instance, is if we go to local guidelines, what we have to do during the pandemic, that that will dictate, do we have hotel rooms, you know, how big the gatherings can be, what the protocol is. So it's a pretty fluid thing. And I think we wait up until the very last minute uh, and, and, and to see if we can execute safely. Uh, and then we have to make that decision to, you know, eat, go or no go. And, and, and like I said, what drives everything is athlete safety first. Mm -hmm. Where do you look, and I know you've got to juggle with this one, and, and one of the things I admire is the politics that you do have to juggle dealing with the IOC, USOC. Um, I, I think you should get danger pay for that. Um, talk to me about Tokyo 2020, now Tokyo 2021. All indications are it will happen. Is that the way you see it? Yeah, you know, um, what we're getting is that everyone is focused on making it happen. Again, yeah. uh, being flexible to doing it in a safe way. Um, it was it was difficult. I think, you know, we took a leadership position along with USA Swimming early on in the pandemic to make sure that our athletes' mental health and their, you know, athletic readiness was at the forefront and recommending uh, that we did not move forward in that uncertain time. Uh, what it did create however, is uh, a need for us to come up with innovative ways for athletes to continue to train, step up support for them from a mental health standpoint, and really be flexible getting them back to play as soon as we possibly can. Uh, so everyone is hopeful and working toward having uh, a safe games. I believe it'll look uh, much different than it has in the past. Yeah. Uh, but what I'm getting in terms of uh, feedback right now is that the games will proceed uh, according to schedule. Um, are you, were you surprised when cross country was not added to the winter Olympics or did you kind of expect that knowing the politics within the IOC? You know, it is, um, let me just say, uh, nothing surprises me. Okay. Whether you're disappointed or not. Uh, I think that you have, uh, I think that, that the, the global governing body has a lot, to uh, manage and juggle. I mean, you have no shortage of uh, sport enthusiasts, including our sport, that are passionate about things being added in the games. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and of course, we'd like to see you know our sport uh, represented in, in, in as many events as possible. So, so you know, disappointing on one hand, but um, like I said, nothing really surprises me, uh, and it's hard to know exactly what goes into those decisions. Uh, this is, again, juggling politics. Uh, a while back, Seb Coe, the, the CEO of the World Athletic, gave an award to Tommy Smith and John Carlos and then Pete Norman's wife, or Pete Norman's, yeah, I give it to his wife, about the 1968 protest. 
And uh, Mr. Bach called it self-marketing, and I totally lost my stuff on it and reminded him of some of his predecessors. I think sometimes there's a, th there seems to be this certain, I, I want to see them succeed, but I get a little frustrated. Uh, how do you, when there's times I know you have to bite your lip, how do you, how do you deal with that on a global athletic stage? Well, I, I think at the core, you know, listen, uh, I serve on the USOPC uh, Racial and Social, Social Justice Council. Uh, I am um, a Black American, African American attorney. Uh, I believe in free speech. I believe in the rights of our athletes. I believe in using your platform in an effective way to, you know, have a positive impact on culture. Um, social justice. I think that globally, we're both at an inflection and a tipping point, right? These okay. people are front and center that need to be dealt with. And, 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 you know, I'm inspired, you know, my son, who's a football player in Notre Dame, has taken a leadership role uh, in using platform, his platform in a positive way to effectuate change. So, you know, for me, it's interesting because being considerate and respectful of a global point of view is really critical. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we're talking about human dignity and human rights, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's critical that when we have that conversation, everyone's perspective is appreciated, respected, and people should listen for understanding. And for me, you know, uh, the events over the last 12 to 18 months clearly is a clear statement uh, of humanity uh, that we need to deal with some of these issues. So uh, I, I look at our sport, um, you know, and I can't say enough. I mean, you know, track and field has been at the heart of social change since the beginning, you know, and we have yeah. some tremendous heroes and athletes along the way that culturally have made the difference, been in the middle of uh, improving diplomatic relations and social justice discussions. And right now, in my opinion, it's a human rights issue. So, um, you know, just having those conversations in a respectful way, uh, but considering everyone's point of view. Um, recently uh, came out that uh, there's gonna be a new movie on Jim Thorpe and there's a change.org um, position right now trying to ask the IOC when they're going to recognize Jim Thorpe's med medals from 1912 in his amazing performances. Where does USA Track and Field stand on that? Well, um, I can't speak officially on behalf of the organization. Uh, sure. I think that, um, you know, uh, celebrating and recognizing uh, the important contribution that uh, everyone has made is, is, is really critical. Uh, I think that we have a lot of stakeholders and a lot of influencers in the sport uh, uh, that, that for me, uh, it's not that I have a point of view one way or another, but I'd, I'd like to get more of a, uh, an informed position for the organization. Okay. Um, so for one day, I'm going to make you the CEO of World Athletics. Give me two things that you would change in the global sport or that you would like to add on. Um, I would say that, um, you know, I work really closely with John Ridgen and those guys. I, I think that, uh, well, let me just say this. I think that they have done an amazing job with the governance overhaul. I think yeah. that when you look at uh, what it takes to, run the business of the sport and support, you know, our athletes and our programs, the general public does not get the benefit of benefit of peeking behind the curtain and seeing some of the constraints that are put in place to allow you to do that. So first mm -hmm. I want to give them credit, uh, you know, Sebco and John Ridgen and the entire organization for uh, some governance reform. The second thing I think that they're chipping away at uh, which I think is really awesome, is developing and securing more commercial resources. Uh, you know, there is a finite amount of money out there uh, yeah. to promote our sport. So really trying to organize, you know, the sport globally in a manner. To And you raised it earlier in terms of promoting events, the predictability, the visibility of the sport. Uh, but, but I also am really looking forward to um, the president, Seb Coe, continue to have a 
global thought leader voice when it comes to sport, you know, positioning our sport within the Olympic realm, but the visibility with all sport. Okay. All right. I'm going to make you the head of NBC Global Sports TV for a while. Um, what two things would you do to change? What things should be added or changed in the way we we see track and field on TV now? So, so here are a couple of exciting things. Uh, and again, I'll go back to my entertainment properties crew. Yeah. In 2013, we decided to get ahead of the curve and set up our digital platform. So USATF.TV was ahead of the curve. And I think that what it allowed us to do was show the changing consumer habits of content. It also showed the value of our uh, properties, right? And mm -hmm. so when you see a tick up in ratings or traffic on a website or a platform, then it tells uh, you know your broadcasting company that there are things they can do to promote it and those kind of things. I think one of the things that are, that is pretty uh, exciting right now as a tremendous opportunity is the shift uh, towards streaming. You know, again, COVID being at home has really changed viewing. Yeah. Habits. So with, uh, with with NBC Peacock, you know, we'll probably work with them really closely to migrate some of our content. I think it allows for some really creative marketing and promotions uh, that are not necessarily the traditional ads and linear TV, uh, but but really um, the presentation covering the, the sport in a different way. You know, we have we have, uh, uh, you know, the diversity of our sport sometimes um, hurts us in terms of covering it because we have a lot of different events. Right. Yeah. But I think it also allows us the opportunity having the digital platform uh, to really cover events in a really, really uh, vertical way for those people that are passionate, whether it's a field event, you know, long distance, I mean, all of those kind of things. So, sure. so, so really positioning and transition over to the digital platform and cross promotion is really um, something I'd like to see. There, there were obviously challenges last year as you guys were considering doing the Olympic trials. How do you see the challenges for this year? Let's just assume that Tokyo, we hear that, hey, everything's groovy with Tokyo and you've got to name a team. Um, how late can you go before you have to announce we're going to have to uh, do small meets, or we're going to have to do something different with the trial? Yeah, I, we're already in the process of looking at ways to stage the event to get the same result and do it in an efficient and safe way. Mm -hmm. um, it is incredibly helpful that we have an amazing local organizing committee in Track Town. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have a community and a culture that really understands the sport inside and out. So being able to be flexible without um, watering down or affecting the integrity of the events uh, is something that we're doing. So that's it's, it's pretty fluid. Uh, I would say that there are different versions of how we get there now. Uh, Robert Chapman, Duffy Mahoney and their team working closely with Mike Riley to take a look at that. Uh, but we plan again. The plan right now is to conduct the trials. Uh, do it in a way that's safe for our athletes uh, and, and get the best possible team for Tokyo. I love Duffy Mahoney. I see the guy at, at stuff all the time. I mean, I met him when I was coaching in Santa Clara and he was at St. John's. He's one of your um, true characters with USATF and the guy I love for it. But when I have a question about how to build a track, there's only one guy I go to. You have resources like that within USA track and field. Um, how helpful is that, is to, to have someone in an area that you don't have to be an expert in, but you can call on them? So, so my mother told me when I was a kid to know what you don't know and to bring in those people who know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that I'm incredibly proud of with USA Track and Field is we have literally the most diverse organization within the Olympic movement. And that is diversity of thought, that is diversity of experience, that is, you know, and it, and it runs a gamut. To have Duffy Mahoney uh, and his body of knowledge and expertise and passion, right, in one area, yeah. to have uh, Adam in another area, to have, uh, you know, Chelsea, who has a fresh perspective on branding and marketing, to have Susan's experience, you know. Yep. When you look across the organization, and, and I, I don't know of a better COO in the Olympic movement uh, or sports generally. So for me, I have the benefit of having an incredible team We've been really deliberate about it. We constantly look at our organization and figure out how do we get better from a system standpoint, bringing in top talent. We just brought on uh, Sarah Hollis, uh, running marketing and revenue 
tremendous asset to our team. So to your point, um, the biggest uh, asset that I can be to this organization is to stay out of everyone's way, <laughs> you know, hire a good group of people and, sure. and try to lead us in a certain manner. Uh, recently, you had a, uh, a vote or an election, I guess you call it, on the executive board. And I don't know how to explain it to my readers. So Mike Connolly, who I've respected for years as an athlete, but seen him working within USATF and, you know, great guy. He's now the chair of the USATF board of directors. Is that how you explain it? Yes. Yeah, so, so just to be clear for your readers, um, I, as the CEO, and I'm saying this so I can answer the question objectively, sure. I do not okay. vote on that. So okay. I am you. an ex officio okay. member of the board of directors. Mm -hmm. So we have been required for some time now by the USOPC to have certain governance uh, reform and certain ways to govern the organization to be in compliance. This is the first year that the USOPC will certify us and we will be audited for our compliance okay. uh, with new standards. So one of the areas uh, that the board had to address was in the same manner that virtually every committee in the organization, the board of directors elects its own chair. The chair can also be the president if the board elects it. So um, the board recently had an election for chairman of the board. So Mike Conley was elected the chair of the board um, and, and, and Vin Lanana as the president becomes the vice chair of the board. So he's an okay. officer on the board. He's the president of the organization. And Mike Conley is serving as the chair of the board. And he's on the board by virtue of being the chair of high performance. Now, is Stephanie Hightower still on the board? No, Stephanie uh, Hightower is uh, a member of the organization and will remain passionate, but she is. Oh, not yeah. OK, I was just. And then Coach Miller, is Steve still on the board or did he retire? No, Steve is retired too. So Stephanie termed out and Steve Miller termed out. Uh, okay. You know, just huge supporters of the sport, but they're sure. not. Sure. Okay. Um, about 1990, Steve Miller said something to me that I, I've kept in my mind. He said, look, he said, we've got to professionalize the sport. If we want people to take us seriously, we've got to upgrade everything we're doing. And I really kind of keep that as a mantra. And I think that's what you've done with, with USATF, but it's been a challenge this year. Um, and people, the reason why I, I wanted, wanted to talk with you today is to see that you're dealing with the pandemic the best that you can. People are starving for meats and starving for content. We've seen you support now the American track meets. You're supporting Mark Wetmore at the New Balance Indoor. Will we see this involvement and what I'm calling it almost is you guys are kind of becoming the Pied Piper of running an American track and field and that. And I think this is really cool. You're putting stuff here. You're putting stuff there. You're, you're kind of, in, you're investing like you did in other past jobs. Um, you're, how does your past experience help you in this position that you're in now? Um, I, I'll say this. So, so I think that, I think that what, what we've done uh, from a process standpoint uh, is set like what our what our goals and objectives are in terms of uh, you know fan, not fan engagement and athletic performance. Mm -hmm. uh, then we've put together uh, a team of people. Andrew Valman is the chair of men's track and field. Rose Monday is the chair of women's track and field. Sure. Then we have our development chairs, and we kind of scour the country to figure out who's doing things at a high level. Uh, we've engaged our elite coaches. Uh, that are training athletes in different regions of the company, country, you know, what kind of events are out there. And then we've come up with a formula uh, that where we can support our athletes. And we do that in a way that we make sure that they can get their qualifying marks, that they have really great competition. Again, mm -hmm. it's done in a safe environment and it's sanctioned by USA Track and Field. I would say that, um, you know, working in NASCAR, uh, and representing athletes over the course of my career. Uh, it really has taught me um, the importance of grassroots support. It's taught me how, it's taught me how to engage people uh, at a national and a local level. And it's also taught me what I said earlier, the importance of teamwork and people together. So, so for me, you know, my primary job is to go raise the resources and find the resources to support it. 
And then I've been listening really carefully to that team of people I talked about saying, hey, what is the most effective way uh, to, to invest those resources? Mm-hmm. What um, with the championships that have been canceled, will you plan on redoing them? Like the NCAA canceled the NCAA cross country in November, and they're going to be holding it March 15th. And then in, in the fall, they're going to do a 2021 championship. Um, how is USATF looking at championships like that? Are you going to hold some of the ones that have been canceled? Or are you just going to say, hey, look, we can't do it? So, so I think, you know, I'm looking to the, um, the high performance leadership to figure out uh, uh, what the best investment of those resources are. So what we're doing is saying to high performance athlete advisory, hey, let us hear from our coaching community, our athlete community, you know, and our experts to say, you know, what is the best way to use those resources to achieve our goal, to feel the most you know, the number one track and field team in the world for international competition. So, so to be honest with you, um, it's really interesting. And uh, my perspective changes based on the feedback. And I think that what we're doing in real time is Mm -hmm. evaluating, um, you know, what is the best way to support our athletes? You know, they want to compete, they want to be able to earn money, you know, and they want to go compete around the world. And so, so, so we're looking at that. So if there's a way to like move the date of an event later, we will do that. If it's impossible logistically to do it, we will reallocate those resources to support other events later in the year or training and development. And, and, and let me just say this. Um, we were able during the pandemic to have about five different programs and distribute over a million dollars to our athletes directly and, uh, you know, a significant amount of money, a few hundred thousand dollars to our coaches directly. We were able to provide grants to our athletes to buy equipment to train at home. You know, we stepped up our support for mental wellness. You know, so there are a lot of things that we were able to do with the resources that we had to support our athletes during this totally unusual and unpredictable and crazy time that we're living through. We have all but how you right now a pandemic lessening are we waiting till the fall do you think it's going to take till 2022 to really get us back to where we were are we never really going to get it back and it's going to be we've got to be pretty vigilant yeah you know it's a uh, it's something i think that we're all pretty emotionally exhausted by because uh we have very little control over it um uh, i think that what all of us are trying to do is safely get back to, um, you know, what we remember as normal. Um, yeah. I think there will be a new normal, you know, and I think that uh, I'm really encouraged by, you know, what's happening medically, you know, to address the pandemic. Sure. I just think it's going to take time emotionally for people to kind of get back into a comfort zone. Uh, so for me, it's really, um, you know, I, I think a lot about what the new normal is going to look like and, and, and really, you know, as a leader of this organization and even with my own family trying to be, you know, consistent and stable and reassuring, um, you know, we need hope and we need, uh, you know, we, we need some regularity in our lives. Sure, sure. Um, are we going to see, once the pandemic ends, are we going to see events in Indy? Are you guys going to be putting, uh, are, you, are you considering doing track meets in Indy or consider doing old days? Um, I'm just curious kind of where your thought process is. Yeah, we, we are. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I grew up here and I remember the days at Carroll Stadium. Uh, I think all of our athletes um, geographically love Indianapolis. Yeah. Uh, I've been working really closely with the leadership in the city here, both on the indoor and the outdoor side. So mm-hmm. we're exploring ways to do that. Um, people are eager to do that. And, and Indianapolis is a commu- community that obviously embraces sports. Um, you know, sure. we're excited about, you know, being able to be the host of March Madness, you know, in this crazy thing. But I think it's just a testament to, to how much uh, the, the people of the community in Indianapolis love sports. So the short answer to your question is yes, we will be looking to do that. Uh, in February of 2020, uh, you guys hosted in Atlanta, the Olympic marathon trials, which I think was, 
one of the best I've ever been to. Uh, you know, Rich Kana and his team did a killer job. Um, I just want to make sure because there's a little rumor. The team that made the 2020 Olympic team there and was named, they will be competing in the Tokyo Olympics. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Okay. Um, that is correct. And, and I also want to um, acknowledge uh, Rich and his team's hard work. Um, they did an amazing job with the trials. Um, and, and I can tell you that um, just even with some of the new international rules, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter if it was a Mitch Garner or a David Katz or a lot of people in our stakeholder ranks really rallied behind to, to, to volunteer their time and their expertise and lend it to Rich and his team. They yeah. had an amazingly executed event and it was just, it was, it was first class all the way. Yeah. No, I just really enjoyed it and, and uh, wanted to give you a chance to say a little something about it. Cause I know we haven't chatted in a while. Okay. You've survived 38 minutes with me. So um, what was the first Olympics that you watched? Do you recall which Olympic games you first saw as a kid? You know, um, God, I, you know, I, I can tell you I've seen so many of them and I looked forward to them. But mm -hmm. what was really interesting to me was uh, the very first one I attended in this job. Okay. Uh, because it, 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 because um, as inspiring as the Olympic Games are uh, and as unifying as they are, I think seeing all the hard work that goes into uh, the execution in those games, watching the athletes uh, interact with one another, you know, seeing the people up close and personal come together and have conversation from around the world, right? It, yeah. it really affected me uh, even more. I, I, I became, you know, obviously excited rooting for our team, but at the same time, really fascinated with everything that transpires around those Olympic games. Sure. So, so I would say that the most, the most meaningful one for me uh, was London. And I had an opportunity to experience a portion of that with my family and my kids when they were younger. Oh, so, awesome. So, so that, that was pretty amazing. It really was. Cool. Well, Max, thank you again for the time. Thank you for all you do for the sport. Um, and thank you for just, uh, you know, asking questions, answering questions. I know sometimes you can't, uh, but I also appreciate uh, your frankness, too. And uh, I hope to get to see you at a track meet soon. You know, the last time I think I saw you was bopping around Des Moines, you know, That's in right. 2019 as you're going from one meeting to another. I, I just don't even know how you survived because I, I think I counted one day. You probably had 15 meetings. I'm just going, oh, man, does he get a soda? Does he get a cup of coffee? Can he watch the 400, you know? Yeah. But, well, I look forward to seeing you, too. Thank you for all you do for the sport. All right, Max, thank you very much. This is Larry Eater with uh, Socialing the Distance, and we featured Max Siegel, the uh, CEO of USA Track and Field. And uh, Max, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be having this up in the next week or so. I'll send links to Suze. And, um, and thanks again for your team. They, they're thank always you. very helpful. Okay? You really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater, Run Blog Run. With our program, Socialing the Distance, this week we featured Max Siegel, CEO of USA Track and Field. Um, Max is a uh, – likes to, people to see that his actions uh, speak louder than his words a lot of times, but I thought for the last 40 minutes um, he was very transparent. He talked about the sport. Uh, no subjects, so you know, were off limits. I didn't get any of that stuff, which um, – I have had people in the past try to do that to me, but Max didn't do that at all. Um, I like that he's a straight shooter. Um, I like his background coming from NASCAR. Um, and what we talked about, first of all, I congratulated him on getting involved with the American Track League in a big way. And he gave credit where credit's due to Adam Schmenk, uh, the USATF producer who handles a lot of the programming. And, and I think he, you could see his imprimatur on there. Uh, the second uh, meet was well done without a Bolden Paul, uh, Swangard, and Lewis Johnson. They did a great job. But the athletes really shown. And that's the thing with, the, with great programming. The athletes can be seen. You can see their story. And you can see their performances. Because at the end of the day, what TV is supposed to be, what Bud Greenspan got, what Peter 
in sets is that Olympic athletics is all about the storytelling. Tell the story well. Let the competition speak for itself. Have announcers who love the sport and are educated and have the data to do it well. And that's what we saw last weekend. Looking forward to seeing that in meeting three. Well, we had several other topics that we talked about. Uh, we talked about Mike Connolly becoming the chair of the USATF uh, board. Uh, also did not know that Max did not vote on that at all because uh, he's kind of ex officio. Um, talked about their challenges a, a bit. He, he alluded to some of the standards that the USOPC um, now requires USATF, which is one of their biggest federations requires them to do. Uh, he talked about the IOC and some of the challenges they have and how, yes, he'd love to see cross country in the Winter Olympics, but right now that's not to be. I think at the end of the day, Max strikes me as a pragmatist um, and uh, he has uh, about $40 million a year from Nike to use to build the sport. At one point, I called the USA Track and Field the Pied Piper of Athletics, which is what I think they should be doing, leading and throwing things into different pots and trying to help, you know, a, a throw meet here, a, a pole vault magazine here, um, uh, Paul Doyle's meets here, Mark Wetmore's meet. That's how they should be doing it and letting um, free market forces kind of uh, build, help build the sport because I think they can. Um he did say, and I'd like to hear that, that he'd like to see more meets in the U.S. Um, we talked about whereabouts for a little bit because, you know, the truth is uh, I can't blame USATF about whereabouts. This is WADA and USADA, and, uh, but they do educate the athletes, and we kind of gave it the importance it's supposed to. Um, we talked about I, I wanted to hear from him about the Atlanta Olympic trials and that those six athletes – will be on the Olympic team. He does believe that the Olympics will actually happen in 2021. We've got Eugene in 2022. Um, and uh, I threw a, a softball at him about just his favorite Olympics. And he talked about London 2012, taking his kids there and his family and getting to enjoy that as uh, first time he was leading USA track and field. Um, what you get in, in, in speaking with Max Siegel is that there's a thoughtful man there. Um, and I think we, we all see different um, parts of him. I think the managers and agents have seen a part of him. I think the athletes see a different part of him. I think his board and his staff sees another. And I think myself as a member of the media see another part. And um, this is a guy whose uh, dad managed uh, the Beatles. Um, he's been in entertainment his entire life. He is a, uh, in, in, you should check out his autobiography, which you can find it on Amazon. Fascinating story as a kid. It'll help you understand uh, some of the trials and tribulations he's been through and why he is the way he is. But also, and this is something you, you've got to understand, Nike would not have signed that $40 million deal if Max Siegel wasn't there. Um, and I've heard this from several folks in the land of the swoosh. They were impressed with him, uh, including the former, um, including some leaders here. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but uh, Max Siegel impressed USATF to the point that they put money into the sport until 2043, is it? You know, and uh, it's a testament to the most winning team in all of USA sports is track and field. Since 1896, baby. Don't knock it. So Max has got a lot to lead. You know, he's got 1.4 million high school kids. He's got a couple hundred thousand college kids. He's got millions of runners and walkers. Um, and his job is to put as many medals, Olympic medals, world championship medals in the coffers for the USOPC to, grad, to brag about and to get donations off. And... There are times when USA track and field has to go its own path, but he's been able to juggle that. And I find that fascinating. Uh, so 
Thanks, Max Siegel, for 40 minutes, uh, 39 minutes and 40 seconds, actually. And um, I thought you were very clear, very thoughtful. And um, I think it's good for the sport to know who our leaders are. So this is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run, socially in the distance with Max Siegel, CEO of USA Track and Field. And uh, like Run Blog Run. Um, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's really important. That's how we get paid. Those are the eyeballs. We need your eyeballs. And then if you love us, subscribe on the YouTube. And uh, we have 369 videos and audios from 2020. And we have over 2,500 audios, videos, and, you know, weird Facebook things about me uh, up to. So, you know, just delete the stuff about me. And there's stuff for every sport. Uh, event in track and field okay stay safe wear a mask when you're indoors don't make uh do something dumb and uh, when you're outside if you can't be six feet apart wear a mask hydrate exercise call somebody each day tell them you love them and um on wisconsin and go broncos santa clara university and i'm grateful that my buddy gerhard uh, who had a surgery yesterday it went well uh, Gerhard was my training partner in uh, 1980 and 81, and then we ran again in the mid-80s and worked at Runner's World together, and then I lost contact, um, and uh, now we're chatting again, and uh, so I'm happy for him and his family. So, signing off. Talk to you soon.